I don't believe in diversification at all. I, I would own one stock if I could find one great stock. Diversification is a big mistake. I call it diversification. Peter Lynch is talking big about diversification, but he did have one phrase in there that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. He said, if he can find one great stock. Well, that's the trick, isn't it? Find one great stock. Peter is saying a lack of diversification is a privilege. Don't think you can just forego index funds without the finding part. That's key. I am left with more questions than answers after hearing Peter's words of wisdom. Luckily for me, he does go on to explain how the common man, like myself, can find one great stock. It, uh, so I don't believe in diversification at all. I would own one stock. But what I do believe in is if I find 10 good stories, they're all equally attractive, I buy all 10. And I wait to see them unfold. It's like watching 10 poker games. 10 games of stud poker. You watch the cards turn over, story three gets better, story six slips, story seven stays the same, but it goes up 50%. So you sell seven and buy two. That's all I do. So if they're equally attractive, I buy all 10. Then gradually some story says, oh my God, this is getting better and better. And guess what? The stock just went down. So you keep watching 10 stories and magically, because of that rule of stocks going up and down a lot, then you load up. You really, you know, take a big advantage. So Peter Lynch doesn't start with just one stock. He starts with several top stories, as he calls it. And the number isn't important. He says 10 but the amount is really just gonna depend on how much time that you or I have to research companies. I can already hear the comments, oh, but he does diversify, he's buying 10 companies. Well, that is definitely more diversified than buying one, but there are two big distinctions to make here. First of all, traditional diversification means that you are buying many companies in every sector of the economy, in every subsector probably. Investments in every sector are made to mitigate the damage if one single sector or a couple sectors takes a big hit. For instance, if I owned 100 different stocks, but they were all in oil and gas, then my portfolio would take a major hit if regulations were passed limiting fossil fuels. And I couldn't just own one stock in every sector because I would not be protected from the individual risks that are associated with a specific company. For instance, a single company in a flourishing sector could be devastated by lawsuits if an employee gets hurt on the job, for instance. So I would want to own many companies in every single sector if I was concerned with traditional diversification. That way, the only way my portfolio goes down is if all the sectors in the economy are going down on average. Peter Lynch is not talking about that kind of diversification. He makes no distinction between different sectors or different companies that are highly correlated with one another. He is just looking for a handful of standout companies no matter where he can find them. The second major distinction between Peter Lynch's 10 stories and traditional diversification is the filtering aspect. Peter is trying to filter down to the best of the best. He starts with 10, but there's no guarantee that he's gonna stick with 10. He likes to watch the stories play out and then change his investments accordingly. In the short term, the stock market can go up and down in a seemingly random and very volatile way. And this represents an opportunity for Peter to capitalize on short-term irregularities. Maybe one company has a sharp increase in value and another has a drop in value, and there's no material change in the company's story, well, Peter could sell out on one and buy more of the other. In short, Peter will start with a short list of companies and narrow it down as the stories play out. But that still leaves the first question unanswered. How does Peter come up with his short list of companies? People are in industries. They're in the publishing industry. They're in the chemical industry, the paper. Why don't they just stay with that industry? You only need a few stocks a decade. How many good stocks do you need in a lifetime? <laughs> Instead of people, they're in the restaurant industry, they're buying biotechnology stocks, right. oil stocks. Right. It's absolutely absurd. <laughs> People don't understand their natural advantages. The first step is doing qualitative research that leverages your natural advantages. What are the quality companies that are in your industry? What are the quality companies that you interact with outside of work? What are the quality companies that you see growing and expanding in your area? When I ask myself these three questions, I can come up with a short list of quality companies that I know and that I like and that are growing or all of the above, and it doesn't take much more time out of my daily life to just be more conscious of the companies in my daily life. And maybe you aren't ready with a list of stocks off the top of your head, but you can start being more conscious of the companies around you. It doesn't take much time or energy. I used to think investing had to be so complicated, but in the end, it really just starts with locating great companies any way you know how.
10 years after Walmart went public, 10 years after Walmart. Went public, 10 years after it went public, it's a 25 year old company now. Right. You could have bought the stock and made 50 times your money on it. Let's say you were in a town, they came into it and they said, boy, these prices are great, they're doing terrific, yeah. I like the bargains, and you checked it out. You spent a little bit of work on it. Yeah. I mean, people are very careful. They, when they buy a dishwasher, they do some research. They'll put $10,000 in some right. stock they hear on a bus. So if you did a little bit of research, you'd say, Walmart's only 10% of the country. They're not even saturated there. Why can't they go to the rest of the country? Peter Lynch points out that you didn't have to get in early with Walmart. It could have been 10 years after Walmart went public, 25 years after they got started, and you would have 50 x your money. It doesn't have to be early, you just have to find a great story. So let me roll with the Walmart example for a minute. I live in Texas, and a huge grocery store in Texas is H-E-B. I love H-E-B. In fact, everybody loves H-E-B. It's always packed every time I go there, and they're only in Texas. They have 339 stores. They have a lot of room to expand into the other states. However, it's not a publicly traded company. It's currently private, so I can't invest in it. So as soon as H-E-B goes public, this is gonna be a company that I got in the back of my head that I'm ready to look into and invest in. So let's do a publicly traded example. I went to Costco for the first time recently, and it was pretty badass. And yes, I know, I should have gone there sooner. Costco is a great company with a great business model. You have to pay a membership fee just to get into the door, so they're making money off of you before you even walk in. And I was happy to pay the membership because their low prices more than make up for it. Anyway, when I look at the map, Costco has 600 or so stores, and the largest chunk is in California with 139 stores, second place being Texas with 41, and most of the states have just a handful and a few have none at all. So it's not overly saturated. There's still a lot of room to grow and it's a great store. When I compare to the other top grocery stores in the US, Walmart has over 5,000 stores. Kroger and Albertsons have over 2,000 stores. Costco has a long way to go and they're not stopping at the United States. They also have stores in other countries as well. Okay, so I've determined that I think Costco is a great story, as Peter Lynch says. Does that mean I go ahead and buy a large position in Costco today? No. The next step is I have to determine, is now a good time to buy Costco? Is it currently overpriced? Is it underpriced? Is it fairly priced? I have no idea. One thing you're trying to do is That's say, of all people. these public companies out there, here's the company I really like. The fundamentals are terrific. Their earnings are doing well. Their competitors are doing poorly. I think this company's doing terrific. And all of a sudden, the stock might have gone from 40 to 30 because of this decline. That would say, wow, here's a chance to buy it. So you're trying to say some companies might have been overpriced at 60 and all they did was go to 50 and you say, big deal. So you're trying to find companies you liked anyway. Right now you liked them. And now they've had a haircut. If Peter likes a company at a fair price, he still won't buy it. He will wait for a haircut. He wants the stock to drop down to at least slightly underpriced. In Peter Lynch's book, One Up on Wall Street, he gives a simple formula that you can apply to determine if a company is fairly priced or better. This way, I can create my short list of companies that I have great experiences with, and then I can apply the formula to see if any of them are underpriced, fairly priced, or better. Let's keep rolling with the Costco example. Is now a good time to buy according to Peter Lynch's model? Peter Lynch's equation only requires three terms. I need the earnings per share growth, the dividend yield, and the current PE ratio. All three numbers can be found on Yahoo Finance. I go to the top and I type in Costco. Their ticker is cost. And the first two, or I guess the second two numbers can be found straight away on the summary tab. Their PE ratio, TTM, that stands for trailing 12 months. That's just the previous 12 months is 54.35 currently. And their dividend yield over here on the right, it says forward dividend and yield. That is 0.53%. So we'll use 0.53. The only number remaining is the earnings per share growth. To find that, we go to the analysis and scroll down to the bottom where we have the growth estimates. Right here, it says next five years per annum, the analysts estimate that they will grow by 9.67% per year. So that's a score of 9.67. Now that we have the three numbers, the equation is super simple as well. All I need is the calculator app on my cell phone and I can perform this. I put the earnings per share growth and the dividend yield together, add those together, and then divide that sum by the PE ratio, and I have the Peter Lynch number. For Costco, the earnings per share growth is 9.67, plus the dividend yield of 0.53, 
gives us 10.20. Then we divide that by the current PE ratio, which is 54.35, and we get a score of 0.19. Remember, for the Peter Lynch number, a higher score is considered better. When Peter Lynch wrote his book, he would target companies with a score of 1.5 or higher. Any company with a score of less than one, he considered to be overvalued. So according to Peter Lynch's formula, Costco is very overvalued right now, and it is not a good time to buy. For that to change, either Costco's share price needs to go down, or their expected future earnings and dividend yield needs to go up, or both of those things could happen. That would be ideal. So Costco is a great company. I will be keeping an eye out for Costco to get a haircut before I buy their stock. Many investors today argue that Peter Lynch's numbers are too low for today's market and that it'll be too difficult to find companies with a score of greater than 1.5. And I think there is some truth to this. I like to target companies with a score of greater than one instead of greater than 1.5 to account for the fact that markets have gotten more expensive over time. Now that still doesn't change Costco's fate. They're a score of 0.19. That's still very overpriced. So I'm gonna keep waiting on Costco. Now that being said, there are still some companies today with very high scores. Take Toyota Motors, for example. They have an earnings per share growth estimate of 16.8%, which is really high, a dividend yield of 2.26%, a PE ratio of just 6.9, which is very low, and this gives them a score of 2.76, which is huge. This puts them into the very undervalued category. That being said, I personally don't have much experience with Toyota, so I don't know if it's a great story like Peter Lynch is looking for. If you do have a lot of experience or if you're willing to do some research into Toyota, it could be a great purchase right now. If you've never done extensive research on a company before, you can check out this video right here where I go over my process that you can use for reference. Catch you on the flip side.